Welcome to this week's Monday meeting. Today is May 22nd, 2023. Monday meetings are a chance for motion designers from around the globe to connect, ask questions, share inspiration, and engage with industry-leading artists on a level playing field. My name is Mark Sinozzi, and I'll be your host today. And today we'll be having an open discussion, but kind of continuing the discussion we had on the previous meeting about, you know, uh, designing the future and using our skills to really bring that to new tech, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, and one really exciting thing that happened was that uh, one of the listeners shared the episode with John Lapore who we mentioned on the call and John's here with us today so maybe we can you know engage in a little bit more of a discussion with that as well so if you have a question uh, use the raise your hand function in zoom uh, and we'll call on you and if you don't have a mic or a camera or anything and you do want to be involved uh, just type question in the chat window and we will um, filter those and make sure we get you in uh, and as usual this call will be recorded so if you have any concerns about something that was said or if you slipped up and said something under NDA or whatever we will cut that out of that recording and post it uh, with that so uh, the last opening topic I have is just, again, Camp MoGraph 2023. Big shout out to all the uh, brands and companies supporting us because, again, we can't do it without you. So big ups to Otoy, Maxon, Spilt, and Grayscale Gorilla. Uh, really appreciate the support behind everything. And if you are at all interested in becoming a sponsor of Camp, we still have custom opportunities available. So reach out to myself if you want, mark at campmograph.com. Yeah, let's just kind of, I, I would say, dive back into kind of where we left off. Uh, Sam, I see your hands raised up. So I'd love to get you in. And then um, maybe you can kind of tee us off uh, to get today's call started. And then would love to, you know, in, get John involved in, in hear more about what he's doing these days with his kind of background and also moving forward with the kind of futuristic design and just, you know, what's all happening with there. So Sam, why don't you pop right in and, um, and kick us off for today. Welcome. Yeah. Thanks. Um, you had, you had mentioned new AI tools that you were using and I was wondering how many people saw drag GAN. So what is it? Uh, it's a new um, it's a new way of editing uh, photos uh, where you drag little points on the photo and it uses AI to I mean, interpolate into a new image. So let's say you wanted to you took a picture of an animal and you wanted to change the position of its head. You click on its head where it is and you click on where you want the head to end uh, up and it yes, figures it out for you. But it's crazy you can open like a, a a mouth that's closed and it will figure out what was in the mouth uh um, that's crazy and it, it it looks insane i haven't tried it yet but uh you know for anyone looking for for next gen ai tools um it, it looks pretty intense wow yeah, uh, before the call started today, I was just mentioning a few tools that were brought to my attention this past week. One was summarize.tech, where you can pretty much put in any of uh, any YouTube link and it will summarize it in a transcription form. Um, and then you can, you know, expand on that. You can bring it into ChatGPT or any of the LLMs to have it kind of synthesize all that data for you and create chapter markers and all that stuff. So for content creators, I can see that being like a pretty uh, interesting, uh, you know, use case of the AI tech stuff. But, um, yeah, but yeah, you know, things are moving at such a rapid pace. It kind of feels like overwhelming sometimes <laughs> that there's so many new things popping up. Um, and you know, John, I don't know if you've been incorporating much of the AI stuff into your work, or I know you talk with a lot of brands and companies and like, I would love to kind of get a, dare I say, a state of the industry in a way of like, if, if you're using tools like this, or if you have clients really interested in this stuff, 
Um, so welcome to Monday meeting, John. Thanks for coming in and participating this week. Yeah. Uh, thanks. Thanks for inviting me over, Mark. Uh, so yeah, this stuff is I'm right now. What it seems like is we've got this whole landscape that is a whole bunch of like immature experiments, uh, Ooh. leveraging AI. Right. And, and I think it's wildly fascinating to see the, I, I think they're always surprisingly powerful, and then mm -hmm. there's always a pretty easy argument of like, yeah, but still not production ready, still not, you know, the kind of things that are going to drastically overhaul our, our workflows. Mm -hmm. um, from what I have seen, you know, behind the curtain in big tech, uh, everybody is working hard to incorporate these things into all kinds of tools and products and experiences in ways where, you know, I, I think this stuff is going to make a significant impact on everything, you know, not just like, Hey, our, our creative work that we do. And, you know, something I always bring up is like just this broad notion of, you know, I wouldn't get that worried about AI taking our jobs or, or whatnot, because AI is going to take everybody's jobs. Like there will be no jobs for anybody <laughs> anywhere. Like it's right. not just our immediate, you know, pixel pushing community. It's going to be like lawyers and accountants and like anybody who spends a certain amount of time sitting in front of a computer for their work. There's a high chance that that AI can swoop in and like completely disrupt the space that they're mm. in. So, uh, you know, I, I, and to me, that's just like, all right, well, like, let's pray to our policymakers that they can somehow figure out ways around, you know, regulation or universal basic income or any of these other factors. Mm -hmm. Um, but more, more tangibly, like, yes, I'm seeing, I'm seeing this stuff getting implemented. Um, not, not yet in terms of ways that it will replace, you know, creative execution, but more like behind the scenes of certain like software products or tools or experiences Mm -hmm. where AI is going to make those things do things they were never capable of doing hmm. before. And, and it will be able to do things that I don't think could be achieved just with like traditional programming or throwing, you know, X amount of manpower towards things. And I, I like the, and sorry, I'm speaking in like such a vague way, but I, I consider it like this, like there will be a point in the medium future where so much of the content that we experience, and I don't mean like necessarily like videos or music or whatnot, but like think of things that you interact with, like th imagine it being so much more delicately adapted to your personal situation or scenario than mm -hmm. it's ever been capable of, of doing before. Yeah. So. You know that it brings up an interesting thought, um, that, you know, because I have been reading and hearing all these things of like, hey, five years from now, you can create your own Hollywood blockbuster with the actors that you want in it and the, mm -hmm. you know, the type of mood that you want and, and whatnot. And I think that's really, really cool. Everything could almost be customized to your personal taste and whatnot. But I think in my head, what makes, what makes, certain things for me very interesting and cool is that there's a community based around this movie or there's this i don't know i feel like if it gets too personalized we start losing those like uh group i don't even know the how to say it but like well, there's a there's so a positive thing to like the monoculture to the like everybody watched Game of Thrones last night, right? Exactly, like there's something exactly. where that brings people together. And I mean, we're already fragmenting away from that with like there's so many goddamn streaming shows out there <laughs> that I can't possibly keep up with yeah. all of the things and and be part of the like water cooler chatter about 
any of these pieces because it's just there's so there's such an overabundance of this right. stuff out there in the in the wild. And I think this is the trajectory that I see us going on is that we will see like a further like exponential hyper fragmentation of like, okay, you can have anything and everything. And like, you know, like I, I heard uh, a week ago, I heard somebody uh, released a biggie uh, rapping over New York state of mind and rapping Nas's lyrics to New York state of mind. And I was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. Like, this is so cool and fascinating to hear this. And then it pretty quickly, like I, I started imagining that like, but when you have this infinite multiplication table where you can just have now Biggie performing everything, like, I feel like we're all going to get really numb to all yeah. of this stuff really quickly. And there's only so much of it that we'll be able to like consume in a way that's meaningful to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It seems like we're almost, especially with all these, you know, say these new tools that like you had mentioned, they're not quite production ready. They're still just kind of whatever they're testing the waters, right? Like we're, I feel like we're still in that kind of novelty stage of, Oh yeah. wow. Look at what this can do, you know? And it's probably going to take some time, and it's just not as cool to talk about how, well, you know, it can run code for, you know, 24 hours straight in the background and iterate, you know, 24,000 versions of this website or whatever it may be. It's just not that cool to think about that stuff. It's way cooler to think about, oh, Biggie can rap Nas lyrics now. Or I saw something where it was like Frank Sinatra singing Little Wayne or whatever the other day. I'm like, okay, this is interesting. But once you hear it, it, I'm not going back to it per se, but yeah, I, I think it, it's interesting to see how, how these things are evolving so quickly. And um, I guess from, from like a motion graphic standpoint, and, you know, for those who don't know your background, John, maybe you want to just give a little bit of background of where you've come and now where you're going and using that motion design thread as kind of what's, you know, the thread that's keeping it all, you know, within, sure, sure. It, within this industry, because I think it's really fascinating. And, and you're really at that leading edge of what's being done in, in some of the um, stuff you have worked on in the past and how, how that has kind of shaped what we're seeing now in traditional products. Sure. So uh, I started in the early 2000s as a pretty traditional motion designer uh, and uh, found myself working at a studio called Perception, where I ended up hanging out for 16 years. Uh, I, I left there uh, last year, uh, almost exactly a year ago. Uh, at the time that I'd left Perception, I was a principal and the chief creative director. And at that point I had contributed to 30 plus uh, Marvel films and streaming series uh, doing all sorts of like motion graphic -y things like title sequences and, and whatnot, but was particularly focused around the kind of like futuristic gadgets and tech that you see in these films. And through doing that work for many, many years, <laughs> Uh, was exposed to all sorts of really interesting opportunities to work with real world technology brands who were always looking for ways to push the innovation of their products forward and for it to start to feel more like the aspirational visions of tech that we would see in, in movies. Uh, I loved that challenge. It's like a very different kind of thing. It's a very it's like, you know, I describe it as like when you're making fictional tech for a movie, it's like you're painting a picture of a house. And when you're making a real technology product, you're creating the blueprints and you're working with the plumbers and the electricians and the engineers and whatnot to solve all these different challenges. And I loved that particular element of it. Uh, since leaving Perception, uh, I've been really focused on the idea of just kind of elevating this way of thinking about real world product design and applying to it what I consider to be the advanced disciplines that all of us here share 
And I'm also at the same time trying to kind of like wave this flag for like motion graphics shouldn't be some bastard stepchild of the advertising industry. It is this incredibly powerful discipline just in terms of getting ideas across and conveying information in incredibly powerful and useful ways. And so I'm always trying to encourage motion designers to explore areas outside of, I think, you know, the most conventional ways that we think of motion design, um, because, you know, in many cases, rather than making the commercial for the thing, we all have an opportunity to make the thing. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of challenges with that. And it is, it's, it can be very different and it can be very complex, but I also find it very gratifying working on these kinds of uh, experiences and, and challenges. And I'm basically just trying to look for new, new ways and opportunities to present, you know, a lot of what we do, but blending it with like human centered user experience and, and whatnot. Um, to to clients. And I'm finding that it's a great time to be doing that because of all the disruption that's happening out mm. there in the world. And so my, my current role as a consultant has been basically just being someone who's good at jumping into these scenarios where everybody within a team or an organization aren't sure what to make of the technology landscape and horizon, you know, is it, Oh, is it art is, is uh, augmented reality? The next big thing. No wait, Artificial intelligence is the new hotness. Wait, do we right. still need a chief metaverse officer and, and whatnot? <laughs> and just kind of right. walking through a lot of those issues, a lot of those challenges, challenges. And even though a lot of the work that I'm doing is like purely strategic and is almost like pre-design, I mm. find that like motion design is by far the most eloquent way of conveying information and like winning an argument and persuading people within a complex organization around why certain things should be presented or approached in in the way that that we have the potential to do so so yeah that's my that's my rambling statement of intent for for where i'm at right now yeah no that's great and a theme that recurs a lot just through these calls is we are as artists in a very interesting position um that we do need to know tech right? We need to have that design eye, but we also need the technical chops of like figuring out how to problem solve this technical issue or how are we going to do this or that, right? And, and now, like you said, with the disruption as of late, just through so many industries, I kind of feel like the skills that we've just had to have <laughs> over the years is really starting to shine because we can kind of talk to both camps, right? We can talk design, we can talk technical and whatnot. So uh, yeah, it's a it's an exciting time, I think, for motion design and just animation in general. Um, but I also wanna just say this, like this is an open discussion. So if anyone has questions for John or thoughts or whatever, um, please raise your hand and, and get involved. Um, through your experience at Perception, you were doing a lot of UI, right? Like UI, UI, like futuristic, I'm thinking like Iron Man and like all mm -hmm. the nice Marvel stuff. How have you seen that evolve into what maybe 10 years ago was like, oh, this cool sci-fi look. And now you see it on the touch screen in a car or whatnot. You know, like I would love to get your point of view on how that's that kind of story arc has has happened over the past you know time yeah it's an interesting thing and i i also get you know i've spent so much time in that sort of fu future uh tech space that i get a little salty about like i almost dislike the term futuristic in terms of this thing of like designing something in the style of the future, you know, which means <laughs> right. you use ray flyer typefaces and you cut the corner, one corner off of every rectangle <laughs> and there's lots of circuitry lines everywhere and, and whatnot. And uh, for me, it's, it's always been this approach of trying to really use some of the like 
real world user experience principles around figuring out like, well, why, why are we making every single design decision that we're making and how can we let things other than just the aesthetic or the look um, or the, you know, the vibe of future tech Mm. drive the design decisions that we're making so that hopefully we can create something that, will feel as though it's from the future when this movie comes out and will still feel like it's from the future, you know, 30 years from now or, right. or whatnot, when this is something that can still be revisited. Um, now, bringing that stuff into real world products um, is really challenging when you're working on, say, a, a car dashboard. So uh, I, I led the team making the operating system for the electric Hummer, which although it's the most like cinematic vehicle ever made is still a vehicle that needs to safely transport you and your family Mm -hmm. without harming any, anyone within the car or anyone else on the road and whatnot. And you have to start from this place of obsessing over all of the user factors and, and making sure that there's no chance that things could be difficult to read or distracting or whatnot, because the worst case scenario in a vehicle is like really, really, really bad. Right. Right. Uh, And so there's all this work that goes into making sure that strategically everything's sound. And then where you have interesting strategic decisions, you use those as the jumping off point to figure out like, well, how can we now turn this into a more cinematic moment or something that feels a little more dramatic or exciting to endear the user to it and make them say, oh, this is a special piece of equipment that I'm using, but also always have that stemming from not just being like, oh, there's a cool splash screen and animation or whatnot, but have that integrated into some other important function or bit of utility that the product is serving to the user. Because those two things will end up like multiplying each other's force. And if you just have something that's just like, oh, there's a cool dancing icon. Isn't that pretty, you know, th- that that wears off very quickly. But when it's integrated, it's something that's like really serving a purpose for the user. And you can understand that, and you know, that that's the area to start putting your, you know, uh, high fidelity design and creativity energy towards, you can create stuff that's that's really special. Yeah, that's a great, that's a great summary of that. Thank you. Um, Sam, pop on in with your question. Yeah, uh, John, um, you're talking about kind of the future of design uh, made me think of somebody who I've been talking with a lot recently, Julian Beaker. Have you heard of him? No, I'm I'm not familiar with Julian. Okay, Uh, so he started this, um, I don't even know what to call it, the design philosophy or uh, kind of uh, practice of design fiction. Um, yes, yes, yes. Yep. Yeah. And uh, so I'm putting a link in the chat. Sorry there about that. Um, <laughs> uh, so he's doing something really interesting where he's, it's kind of a thought experiment of thinking about the future of, uh, you know, society and design of mostly physical real world products, uh, but kind of, Imagining it rather than from the um, kind of sci-fi movie aspect, which is a very kind of top-down approach, he imagines it of the kind of simple mundane things in the future. And like the the thought experiment starts as like, okay, you, you go into a time machine into the future and you end up in somebody's living room and you have five seconds to grab something in that living room and bring it back here. And so you open this guy's wallet and you see an automotive uh, 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 automotive vehicle driver license, right? And, um, you know, or you, you look at the cereal box on, on the kitchen counter and it's like, okay, what is the cereal brand of the future? And what's different about the cereal box? And it's a really kind of interesting game to play to kind of think about what the average consumer will be buying in the future and how different it is from today and how that can influence our design as artists now. Um, so I, I suggest anyone who's kind of interested in that, check out the near future laboratory. I just put the link in the description. And uh, I think it's just 
a really good game for us to kind of play in the background of our other work um, because then we can start to incorporate those things and it doesn't always have to be those techie lines and lasers and stuff like that. It can be much more, you know, what, what does the desk of the future look like? Um, yeah. you know. And I mean, to, to tie this back to uh, motion design, like, I, and I've done a lot of these sort of uh, initiatives within major organizations where you have to figure out, okay, what are the technology paradigms or the things that will make the most sense to company X 15 or 20 years from now. And you can't just approach that as like, well, in the movies they do this, or wouldn't it be cool (laughs) if dot, dot, dot. And instead would employ this process uh, that I learned from uh, the uh, Amy Webb's uh, future today Institute, where there's this sort of like forecasting approach that you take, where you look at like, what are present day forces that are in the world that are motivating a lot of change and which ones do you think will stay the same? Which ones do you think will increase and get stronger? Which things do you think will get weaker and start to build potential like future multiverse scenarios out of those as a jumping off point. And, you know, as, as creatives, it, it can be really hard to not start from just the pure aesthetic, but when you can build out a a narrative first, that says things like, well, the wealth gap is only getting larger. Maybe 15 years from now, it will be significantly larger than it's ever been. And so the kinds of concepts and designs that we should be creating should be like really, really cheap. And that should be their most important, you know, aspect or component to it. And you start there, you get these amazing results you know, with your creativity and then, you know, any of these results that have a enough of a story that's backing them up, it can be, it can be huge. And again, I can't overemphasize enough. Like there is, you know, in so many of the teams and organizations that I work with, the way they would go through a process like this, the end result would be a white paper with like, Mm be a sheet of white paper with times <laughs> new Roman text all over it. And in that same scenario, you know, uh, myself and the the teams that I work with were able to put together, even sometimes at like animatic level of fidelity, something that conveys these thoughts and it has so much more impact. It goes so much farther than just, you know, these, these white paper reports around these findings. Hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. I love the, uh, just the thought of think wider and like, think of like pressing social issues and stuff that are happening now, how that could drive our design thoughts and, you know, things for the future. And it's not about just designing the cool new product or the cool new thing. It's just, well, how do we make it more attainable for people or something like that? Anthony, why don't you pop in? Oh, no, I just wanted to say, like, I appreciate the emphasis on like real world needs instead of like the top down aesthetic thing, because I know there's this theory that like we're kind of crafting our own dystopia based on like movies we've mm-hmm. all seen in the 80s, like subconsciously just like going off yeah. that aesthetic. So <laughs> it's kind of cool to see it from like a practical like aspirational perspective instead of like, wouldn't it be cool if like the Terminator was real or something like that? <laughs> right, right, right. Totally. But I mean, this is, this is a big thing that I'm always pushing for when I'm working with filmmakers and whatnot is like, how can we paint a more of a picture of a utopia than a dystopia? Cause like we, we all have a crystal clear image of what like ghost in the shell and blade runner and all these other super dark and hostile futures look and feel like, and how they function. But we have very few reference points for what is something that it will actually, you know, improve the quality of human life. And I mean, yeah, now more than ever, like how dystopian does everything feel? And we, we need a lot, we need better benchmarks to to compare ourselves to. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Does anyone else have any thoughts or questions or things they want to pop in? 
I would say this too, John, I don't know if you'd be able to um, kind of elaborate a little bit on, you know, some of the, just maybe some of the challenges that you're facing, even like with your background and, and whatnot. And, and maybe it's part of it is trying to get your clients and the people that you work with to understand this kind of vision and process, but also in this day and age, kind of being drawn to all these new cool tools that do things. And, you know, it's how do you, I guess, how do you stay the course in a way, you know, and not get so pulled in different directions based on the hot new topic for this week that some client might have seen on Twitter or whatnot? Yep. Um, So I've been fortunate to have a good amount of experience in this space, which is taught me a few things. Uh, I've also spent a lot of time working with teams where it's not just creatives, um, but that it's, you know, 50% creatives, 50% engineers. Mm. And it's gotten me through the mindset of like making sure that the engineers are trusting that I've got their concerns in mind. They're like, hyper pragmatic, hyper strategic way of thinking that I'm like, I'm looking out for that. And I'm not just like, oh no, the, you know, the creatives are in the room again and they're going to take their drugs and pitch wild ideas that are going to make the engineers lives miserable to try to bring to fruition and, and whatnot, but really understand what it is that's making them tick and, and what their, their core priorities are and being able to balance those two things I find helps everywhere and it helps with, you know, it helps me when I'm working with creatives and whatnot. And like, I would always describe, uh, you know, working with, uh, say a, a giant movie studio and you go into a room full of executives to pitch them, uh, some ideas. The last thing that you want to do is walk into that room and say like, does everybody agree that one of these things is the best piece of art? Like that's something that can immediately trigger a lot of like insecurity in people, right? In, in your clients and the people that are paying you, your bosses that are bringing you on. Sometimes that can just make them feel deeply insecure in the way that like, uh, I, I feel when I'm looking at uh, a wine list at a fancy restaurant and the, you know, and the, and the waiter is standing there being like, do you have good taste or horrible taste? Which one are you going to choose? Right. And so being able to speak to creative from a like engineering or strategy perspective helps to almost coach those people as to like, why they should choose one direction instead of the other. And it allows you to have this like power to kind of like control or lead or guide those, those people that you're working with, as opposed to just this sort of like, okay, these are the options, you know, pick one quick, which one is it going to be? And, 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 and that's helped, that's helped me out because I find that like anytime that there's any of that sort of like insecurity in play anywhere, whether it's coming, whether it's insecurity emanating from me or from my clients, that's where things just like goes off the rails and becomes, Mm. becomes challenging. Um, For those reasons with all the, you know, current things that are popping up on the landscape, it's really important for me to like at all times have a very clear point of view and opinion about where any of these technologies or new paradigms overlap with a team or an organization or a business in ways that are relevant to them. Mm -hmm. So that when there is like the, oh, hold on, this new thing dropped over the weekend, is that the new hotness? And should we park everything else that we're doing and jump to this just solely because we're having FOMO? It gives me the opportunity to either say like, Yes, there's actually good reasons for us to pursue that. Or hold on, everybody calm down, <laughs> reevaluate what our priorities are, and not doing that through like, let's let's all remember which piece of art we liked the most, but instead saying, like, hold on, let's stay on strategy, let's stay on point, let's stay on track and stick with the structure that got us to the point where we are here. Right. And I, I feel like we kind of saw a lot of that happening with the whole 
metaverse and the NF, like everyone just jumping like, oh, we got to be here. We got to, you know, and sure, I firm believer that that technology is here to stay and whatnot. But like no one's hanging out in the metaverse right now, at least that I know of. I I don't know anyone else, but, uh, you know, so like it's. I guess it's good that clients and in, in people and brands like this are are paying attention, but I can also see how it, it could really uh, steer the ship in a completely different direction and go off the rails. So, um, so yeah, great point. Uh, Maurice, good to see you. And uh, yeah, John, to your last point, I, I just wanted to say that from, from myself, I feel like I've almost had to adopt a Zen-like attitude to all these things that are happening because it seems like every 45 days, there's a new tool that's all over Instagram and it's a new thing that everyone's talking about and it's going to make your productivity better and it's going to take this job away and that job away. Um, And I think the, the thing that I try to keep in mind is just keeping blinders on, you know, from, from myself and just, just staying the course and just learning what I want to learn. Um, the thing that I struggle with, or the thing that I think about most is like, what's our future going to look like? It's just humans can't tell, humans can't tell the future. And so trying to anticipate how that's going to impact like my career trajectory or what my life is going to look like, or my ability to make a living really, unless if, if you want to boil it down to, you know, brass tacks, um, it's, it's just difficult to know. And so just basically just trying to be mindful and adaptable, I think is what I'm trying to do. Um, just because I'm, I'm sure that whatever job is going to be the norm hasn't even been created yet with all these AI tools. Um, mm-hmm. So those are just things that I, you know, that what you had just said just made me think about. Yeah, I think, I think everything you said is really sound. And I think it it is important that like, you know, when you say staying, you know, Zen, I think that's, that's perfect. And I think it's also critical that in staying Zen, you're staying connected to like the real purpose of what your projects are that you're working on, which is, you know, often to communicate or to persuade or to get some piece of information across. And as long as that's always being done, you know, better than it, than it was previously and and just improving that, that'll apply to any of these tools, any of these, you know, things that, that are put together and, you know, we, they're not going to just create themselves. They are, they are going to need the right level of guidance and, and strategy to drive any of these things in the right direction. Yeah. Pop on it. What's up, Jeff? Hey, John. Um, so I'm in a unique position because I'm working with a AI startup right now. Um, I can't go into super details, but for me, AI seems like a shift to remove further barriers to creativity um, by relieving us of the necessity to know all the tools and all the things and how every all the mundane stuff like uh character rigging or retopology or you know even to some extent like concept design right um you may be an amazing 3d artist but you can't draw very well and so but you've got an idea for something you can put it in a mid-journey and within you know 10-15 minutes you get a concept and it's not perfect, but it's close enough to get you started. Right. Um, and I think as if we look back in history, like there's been shifts in technology that have disrupted, um, the normal day in day out of how people do their jobs and people always get worried and don't like change. And I feel like this is just another example of, change is coming like 30 years ago it was computers and the internet now it's ai i mean i i I think we can look at it as a if there's ways that this can help me be more creative and 
remove some of the limitations of all the stuff I have to know to do to, to get my thought and my idea out into the world. I think there's a lot of potential, um, like it's very positive versus, oh, the world is coming down and Skynet's out there and, um, you know, Terminators are five years from now. Yeah. I mean, says, says the guy who figured out a way to create, you know, algorithmically generated (laughs) infinite, uh, Star Trek spaceships. Right. Um, um, no, I, I mean, I, I think, I think that's uh, like, I, I, I can't pick a side on, on this because like, I I'm with you, like there's something really beautiful to, uh, being able to not have the tools stand in the way of vision. And it's both empowering and scary when I talk to a film director who is like, yeah, we're actually not hiring concept artists for this sci-fi film that we're working on because like me, the director is just opening mid journey and it's Mm -hmm. magical to me because I have the vision and now I can create the results without having to have a week of back and forth with Mm -hmm. a concept artist. And I'm like, that's amazing for you. That's so bad for the concept artist. And, um, you know, and like, there's, there is a degree to which like, I feel for, you know, Phil Tippett when I'm watching the the ILM documentary and they see the Jurassic Park renders for the first time and they're just like, fuck, we're done. But, you know, there were there were a lot of, you know, people like Stan Winston and and many others, you know, figured out how to pivot and adopt mm. the new technologies that were coming and that, you know, that certainly helped them in a certain, in a certain regard. Whereas, you know, the, uh, I don't know if you've like seen any of the stuff that like Phil Tippett has been up to in, you know, the most recent stage of his career, but like he's turned into a really salty, dark dude. Who's like, I'm still going to do it the way I always did it. And there's beauty and there's craft to it. Um, but it's, it's made it a lot harder for him in what he does in his, in his career. Yeah, for sure. And I, you know, to the point of the concept artist too, I hope they can take these tools and become the craziest concept artist they've ever been. And now they're doing, who knows, maybe they're making a book. Uh, I don't know, but like, hopefully they can take those tools and it will bring them to a completely different level. And one thing uh, I see a couple hands up, but one thing I just wanted to say really quick as well, and this is um, similar to what Jeff brought up in terms of like productivity and all that. Um, we all know Warhol. You probably know who Jeff Coons is. So Jeff Coons was just on 60 Minutes last night. Okay. I've actually, through my former employer, was able to like go to his studio and all this stuff. It was really cool. But he has a team of people. He has a whole warehouse of artists. And his, you know, people are like, but he he's not even doing the art. And he's like, well, I can't do the art because it's going to limit how much art I can make. And his point in like Anderson Cooper was the one interviewing him. And he said, he, he was like, Anderson, if you had to come in here and you had to set up all the cameras, you had to do the lights, you had to go back, you had to edit it, you had to, you know, do everything. How many of these pieces would you make in a year? You know, and Anderson's like, well, yeah, I, I get it. I'd probably nothing. And as, you know, smaller artists or smaller studios or freelance artists or whatnot, having these tools to help you produce this stuff by yourself, even if it's rough concept or whatnot, I think as a creator is very exciting. Sure. There's always going to be that 1% or the 0.1% or something that take it into a different direction and do bad with it than good. But um, I don't know. I just, I think there's a lot of similarities in that kind of uh, work process where now we don't have to, I don't want to say we don't have to hire all these people. But again, as a small little studio, I don't have budget to hire all these people. So it's going to allow me to do better work, you know? It, and so I'm really interested to see how that plays out. And I see Natasha, you have your hand up and then Sam again. What's up, Natasha? Nice to see you. 
Nice to see you again, too. Um, so I thought a really interesting point that you made was about income inequality. And then um, some of you may know, probably most of you don't, I have a little bit of background like working in rural Nepal doing development work. So I'm really curious about the way that um, like these technologies, like both bringing these kind of indigenous ways of doing things from people who are like living in a very, you know, like living with very limited resources, but they, they find a way to um, make use of them. Um, and are like living very close to the earth and 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 then also there's disciplines like biomimicry which can help um like guide technology to make it more like also sustainable with the earth and re less resource heavy and then like on the flip side how can how can tools like AI be used to help people who are still like, like they might still be like pretty disconnected from technology. They might be unbanked, um, you know, all of these kind of issues. Like, you know, our, our like we have in, income inequality increasing here, but then if you look on a global scale, then it just becomes that much more like um, disparate. So I know I'm going like a little different direction, but I was curious to hear your thoughts on that. Sure. So, uh, there's, there's a lot of interesting things that you touch on. Um, I think there's something magical about the way that not just AI, but even other things like TikTok and and whatnot, we are seeing particularly kids be explosively creative and do very like technical kinds of things that to them, I don't think feel very technical mm. and doing it entirely with their smartphone. And, you know, it's, it sort of reminds me of the way that like, um, digital payment transfers that we all use very casually today were being used first um, in places that aren't as technology centric in the world where people were using that on like Nokia candy bar phones. Uh, and, and that was like actually creating an economy in places where they didn't really have access to even banks and all of a sudden being able to do like, I can text you a payment on my cheap Nokia, uh, all of a sudden like made an economy explode. And like, I feel like I see the same thing happening with, uh, content creation and the cleverness around it. And I also sort of like the way that there's also this, uh, this sort of like disregard for fidelity or like obsession over quality. And it's more just like, is there just a cool transition that I can make through the, the crappy green screen effect and a careful move of my, my smartphone or whatnot. And that makes something that's more compelling or keeps my, my story or my ideas out there. And so I think there's a lot of really interesting potential with that. When you combine it with, you know, pretty much all the AI tools you can use from your personal device with great ease. I do think there's a huge scenario where like AI becomes the render engine, you know, as we know it. Um, for a lot of the things that we do. And, and I think that'll, you know, it, again, it'll, it'll further like democratize creativity. Um, and I, you know, I do get a little sad when I see the craftspeople whose skill I request, I, I have tremendous reverence for do a little bit of like the gatekeeping of like, but if you don't know how to use the expensive tools that I've mm. been using for the last decade, maybe you shouldn't be allowed in, you know, I think, I think there's going to be some interesting like opening of the, of the floodgates here. Mm. Anthony, come on in. Oh yeah. Um, I was just wondering for, for folks who really enjoy like the execution and the process as far as, um, making motion design or anything else goes. Um, I was just curious because it seems like that execution will be a lot less important going forward, like the hours and such of which is good. There's like going to be less time spent on that sort of thing. But where do you think artists will get that like artistic gratification in the future if there's not as much of that actual like trial and error and execution or will it just look different? Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's just going to look 
different. I mean, uh, I've talked to a, a creative who took tremendous pride in like creating his own render engine from the ground up and like you had this sort of swagger of like you bought your render engine i like you know i coded my own render engine like how cool is that and like i was like i'm wildly impressed by that but it's not for me and this is just going to be like a whole other level beyond beyond that of that same sort of approach and i do think there will be a corner of the industry where there are clients who want to pay a premium for like artisanal vinyl record graphics that were made entirely without AI. There may even, I mean, culturally, there's a chance that 50% of society says AI is perverse and disgusting and we want nothing to do with it. So we only, in this house, we only consume organic content, you know, or or whatnot. <laughs> oh boy, but, here we go. Organic content, I like it. But, you know, we'll we'll have to we'll have to see, you know, how how those things shake out. But I mean, again, like I I think, you know, all of the things like, you know, like most uh, all us on this call, like, are we all making our stuff with like pencils and paints and whatnot? Like we're already taking tons of shortcuts with the tools that we have provided to us. Uh, Sam, then Sean. Yeah, so uh, t touching on a couple things. One was um, the the notion of like making everything in like CG versus like the old school way things are done, you know, the Jurassic Park thing. And I think it was really cool to see in like, uh, you know, regardless of what you think about the Mandalorian, seeing those puppets come back mm -hmm. and seeing them being mixed with CG in a way that was convincing and like felt like it had an, another energy that neither of them had on their own. Um, and so I think that was really cool is when, when we're able to take uh, traditional ways of doing things that have taught us all of the lessons that got us here and bring the bleeding edge technology in a way that can play harmoniously with that. I think it was a really cool space to be in. Uh, my dad, who was an architect and did everything traditionally forever, never touched AutoCAD. Uh, you know, I was lucky if he, I, he could attach something to an email on his own. Um, <laughs> and I learned under that like traditional model of like hand drafting with a T square. And so, you know, in terms of using a pencil and, and doing it that way, I understand the things that we learned from doing it that way for so long and seeing all his students learn that way first and then move into CAD and then seeing their senior projects versus those who only ever did CAD, there's such a different energy to the, the mixing of analog and digital than there is just with one or the other. Uh, and so over time, my dad was more and more willing to let me show him technologies that would not replace what he was doing, but but create a conversation with what he was doing. And the last several pieces we created together really had that in a way that couldn't have happened without both those sides coming together. Uh, so as we go into AI uh, and all these other technologies, you know, how can we utilize AI for the things that, you know, we may not want to do at all, like, you know, retopo or something like that, but also where can we play, you know, where can we take hand drawing and painting and incorporate that? So like my, my partner, she's also completely analog. She paints and draws. And one thing we've been playing around with is scanning her drawings of textures at, with a high resolution scanner and then using those to apply to a CG shape and yep. then mixing that with, you know, some high scale grayscale gorilla textures and seeing what happens where we get this interplay uh, be, between that analog traditional methodology and, and whatever the next bleeding edge thing is. Yeah. I love that. And when you do that, you also 
the the other byproduct of that process is you have an amazing story of how it came together, which yeah. I think in in the in the right context or in the right scenarios makes a really big difference. Mm-hmm. Hey, Sean, welcome. Hey, everyone. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, I haven't spoke much this morning. Uh, yeah, I think <clears throat> for me, it's you know, it's 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 really interesting because one of the things I pride myself in um in doing what i've been doing for so long is um you know i almost feel like i'm a magician you know like and i've taught myself how to do all these magic tricks um you know and and they're a little bit you know secretive like and you know then all of a sudden you have all this ai coming out and it's like oh we're just gonna like break into the the magician's chest and open up everything and just like it kind of like something that concerns me is like it the the general conception or you know how people conceive like what we do always was pretty like you know we're elevated like you know technical artists that you know they've they've spent their entire careers and lives like learning how to use these complex tool complex tools and then all of a sudden like this tech comes comes in that's like basically borrow it's like pulling all the information that we've put out there you know and dumping that into like a like, oh, like now we're gonna synthesize like the same thing, but it's automated. And um <clears throat> yeah, so so to me, like that's that's kind of concerning because it like it really does like take away that mystique or that like, you know, that like skill set. Um and uh, or just the perception and which is which is there. Like the the skill is there, you know. But then I also have to wonder like how like is what mid journey is doing and all some of these tech, you know, some of this AI tech is what it's doing, like actually AI yet, you know, like, um, or is it really just, a, you know, like these GPUs are so powerful that they're able to like cram so much information together that like poof out comes something that looks kind of magical, but is it still actually not really doing a whole lot? Like, um, you know, um, there was mention of retopology, like I've yet to see like, you know, there's been software developers that have been working for like years, like trying to automate retopology, but I've yet to see like some tool come out and be able to like perfectly retopologize like a cab model, you know, like that's incredibly detailed and like, you know, I want like perfect quads with like perfect edge flow, like a click of a button, like I've yet to see that happen. So I'm just, those are just a few concerns I thought I'd throw out there um, that are that are weighing on my mind. And and that's a really good point. Artificial intelligence is not actually intelligent. It's literally just averaging everything, right? Like that's what it's doing. And there's a there's a big difference between uh, you know, what we're calling today artificial intelligence and then like artificial general intelligence, which is the scary stuff from science fiction that, mm-hmm. you know, becomes sentient and and all of that. Um it's and it's it's a tricky thing because like yeah the whole idea of like oh well we're making stuff by just averaging out all the other stuff like that instantly just feels super gross right like that just doesn't feel um like how are you going to make something new with that but at the same time like culturally like what what have we been doing with creativity for the last like 40 years right like what's been like truly unique like the closest things to the most unique things that we see are you know today are like oh well it's it's this but done in the style of this you know Uh, and and we're we're, and we're still getting that like over and over and over again uh you know uh we've seen you know, Batman in the style of Michael Mann's heat. And then like, after that, we were like, what if you added a little Cronenberg into it and whatnot? Like it's, and we're just like, we're still playing with that kind of, you know, everything is a remix or everything is built upon what's come before, um, you know, otherwise. So it's, yeah, it's, it's going to be, Interesting to see, like, I I do worry that it also, the use of these tools, the proliferation, the ease at which there is to create content could potentially lead to a, like, hyper averaging of all things. And all of a sudden, like, every single uh, soft drink in the world 
tastes like you went to the the Coke machine and put like every single flavor into it like <laughs> all at once, like every yeah. time and everyone just begins to like accept that is like, yes, this is the dark slush that we consume uh, regularly. <laughs> this is this is what it is. Yeah, I was just going to say, like, I think the, maybe the best solution like coming out of this you know, maybe that could could sort of be implemented is just the kind of watermarking that that I've, you know, that Google yeah. mentioned or like, you know, at their keynote, like, but then again, like I was just reading an article about how like the, the like chat, the tools that people are using to verify if chat GPT content is like, yep. or, you know, to verify if it's from chat GPT, like it's completely failing, <laughs> you know, like and, and chat GPT is also like saying, you know, it's very confident that, you know, you can, you know, submit an organic piece of content and it'll be, it will just claim to have, uh, written it. Um, mm. so yeah, interesting times we're living in. That is for sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I'm just going to kind of, uh, go through the chat just really quick. Um, and I, to go back to like kind of the gatekeeping thing, lucky put in the chat, like, Kind of feeling there's probably more frustration in at the practice required in honing in a skill over decades and now you can kind of do it with a click of a button and you know some it, it's not necessarily about the software cost or whatnot and we're seeing this too a lot in the 3d realm right like blender's making a massive push into it into the 3d kind of industry right now it has always been there but i feel like I want to say in the last year or so, just so much more is coming out and it's free and it's bringing people into that ecosystem. It's bringing people into that industry. Uh, and so, you know, I think everything in due time will, I don't know, I guess it's a probably a good thing bringing more people into it. Uh, we'll get more ideas and whatnot. Um, but yeah, it's changing the landscape. Uh, and, Sandro saying like, uh, you know, using Google Maps for years has kind of made their sense of direction kind of come down a little bit because you're relying solely on, on that stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and Vishal is also saying, um, what do you think about AI tools essentially being like calculators for accountants? You know, AI tech is currently more like a imitation rather than something new or inspired. Um, but then saying that he has a friend that used chat GBT to figure out how to make the animations interactive on their website. So there's I th so many pros and cons uh, with all these tools coming out, but I, you know, we're, we're past the hour mark and we try to keep these about an hour or so, but John, before we hop off, I would love to, you know, just, I asked like, where do we go from here? Where, you know, what are you paying attention to? What are, what are your thoughts on, you know, uh, what us as motion designers and animators should start really paying attention to, or I don't know, even if it's high level concept stuff or all the way down to a detailed software or something. So Mark, you know, I, deeply adore motion design as a discipline. Like mm -hmm. to me, it is this beautiful, beautiful discipline that uh, for me is like this perfect convergence of creativity, technical understanding, uh, storytelling, design, information, typography, all these different things sort of like swirled together are what creates motion design. And I think uh, I, I love motion designers. They are like the, to me, they're the most like well-rounded creative people that I come into contact with. Like I, they're, they're very good at balancing the ephemeral and the pragmatic, because that's just part of like what, what we do. They know, uh, in very intelligently and wisely, like where to make the right kinds of compromises for the right reasons. And to me, like all of those traits are like incredibly 
powerful skills in like so many other industries and in so many other places. And like, if you, if you needed to ditch motion design because the AI bots are bumming you out, like you'll do great in other places that just require like communication with people around you and, and having this sort of like ability to do storytelling and, and to have influence over, over others. But I think, you know, in the long run, these tools are going to continue to impact all of this stuff that we're doing. But I think out of all the people that are going to be impacted, motion designers, I think, are also have this like incredible resilience um, to being able to flow with the changes and new tools or techniques or processes and methodologies, but also have all this other latent brilliance in them from un, like having to understand how do you make a story compelling? How do you make visuals that connect really quickly and really concisely with your, with your audience? And so I, I would encourage everybody to be open to experimenting with and playing with the new tools and trying, you know, some of these new ways of, of doing things and look for ways that it can help you in your, in your process as much as you're, you're comfortable with. Um, but also just always stay, stay honed in on the core of what it is that, that we do that gives value to our clients and to the teams and the people around us, which goes a lot beyond just, you know, pressing buttons in, in whatever piece of software we're using. Mm -hmm. Now it, I'll end it with this too. Do you feel that we are rapidly kind of exploding into tech, especially in the last few years that, you know, five to 10 years from now, there might be that resurgence of like, back to analog because like everything's tech that now it's kind of cool to be a painter <laughs> you know it's like or it, the disconnect uh, not completely being online and i i'm asking this somewhat uh personally too with like the camp mograph thing like i i feel like there's so much emphasis now on technology and just being especially in our industry forward thinking and whatnot that a lot of people just forget kind of where we came from in a way, you know, and, and do you think we might kind of come full circle here, uh, say within our industry or just as humans? Yeah. I mean, I think we're always going full circle. Like I think we're perpetually on like a helix, you know, coil <laughs> that is just always looping around, right? Like we're, uh, it's, it's not, and it's nothing new for our industry to embrace like, more natural ways of doing things. And then to blend that with the new tools and to be like, hey, now we're taking more handmade textures into 3D right. or we're going to do stop motion, but then the stop motion is going to be projected onto something or or whatnot. Like we're, right. we're th this industry, again, loves to do that. Like everybody loves to find these new ways of blending and, and finding these new convergences of all the skills and abilities that we have or that we're learning or that we've seen elsewhere and whatnot and blending them into, into our process. Yeah, that's, that's very true. You do see that. So, well, thank you, John, for being a part of the conversation today and hopping on with us. And, you know, um, I think just the fact that we're having conversations like this are, it is pretty cool. And it shows that, you know, we're paying attention in a way, you know, and, and just taste, taste these new tools, try them out uh, and just kind of pay attention to what's happening. Because I think anything that's, that's going to be a benefit to us just trying to, you know, keep a leg up on competition or softwares or whatever it may be. But I think it's important to keep these conversations happening. So we appreciate you coming in and, and, given your two cents on everything. So um, while we wrap it up here, uh, we'll try to get this thing posted as soon as possible for all those who couldn't make the call today. Um, but thanks again to everybody who shows up each week. You know, this is all about the community and we do this for all of you. So really appreciate everyone showing up. If you want to message us, you can hit us up at info at mondaymeeting.org. 
or on all the social platforms. If you just start typing in Monday meeting, you'll see our little double M logo pop up. Thinking about next week, we probably won't have a meeting because it is a, a U.S. holiday and I will have two kiddos running around in my background here. So we'll probably take a break next week and then hop back in uh, the following week. Thank you all again for showing up and have a great week. Peace out.